Good afternoon and welcome back. What a day so far. Um, I'm Brett Bailey, chairman of the S of SCRS, the Society of Collision Repair Specialists. We've had a great day with our OEM Collision Repair Technology Summit. Um, started this morning from substrate to surface, preparing for emerging trends in automotive technology. Great panel discussion. Followed that up with uh, moderator Mike Anderson and help a comprehensive conversation surrounding accessibility to OEM procedures and technical support. And our final session this afternoon to wrap up our summit um, is meeting the OEM expectation in welding. And uh, probably a tall task when I look across the industry to make sure that we, we reach those expectations. But we've got a great panel lined up today. We've got a great moderator for this, this panel. And uh, without further ado, let's get it going. I'm going to introduce CEO of Vico Experts, Mark Olson. Well, good afternoon. You guys, uh, how many have been here more than four days? How many are like, can't wait for this to be over? <laughs> and how many have been coming for the last 20 years? Um, so first of all, thank you everybody for being here. And one of the things about this panel is that as I walk the show floor, and many of you guys have, you, we're walking the show floor and we're looking at the technology and all the technology that's out there and it's, you know, we're, we're calibrating ADAS, we're doing this, we got all the, this funky electronic thing and all those different things. How many of you guys have been out there going, whoa, I don't know how to make the decision on the electronics and all that? This is the OEM Electronics um, or te Technology Summit. How many of you would actually consider that welding actually is a technology? Would you consider that? So let me tell you how my day started. And I can't tell you, and, and I didn't plan this yesterday because I didn't know what I know now yesterday. So a little bit of a backstory. So a vehicle was repaired in Henderson, Nevada, just down the street here. And the lady was so excited because her husband got a job at Microsoft, but a small thing happened, like she wrecked her car before they were gonna move. So she picked up her car and she drove it from Las Vegas, basically, to Seattle to Bellevue, Microsoft, and Redmond there. But her light was on on her dash. And her seatbelt, when she started taking her seatbelt out of the retractor, it didn't work exactly right. So what happened is she went to the dealer. It's a fairly new Toyota Sienna. She went to the dealer, and what did the dealer do? The dealer looked at it and went, well, we don't know, and it looks like somebody's taken the seatbelt out and put it back in, and that's not quite right, and I guess the door doesn't line up okay, and there's a light on. You know, we should get it to our preferred shop. They sent it to their preferred shop, Once they, and this is a couple weeks ago, and the preferred shop took a look at it and went, oh, we got a problem. We don't want to get involved. You could call Vico Experts. So they called us. <clears throat> we turned around, and one of our guys went out and looked at it, and they went, oh. So I saw what I saw, and I talked to the manager of this shop, and I said, you know, you probably should buy the car. Of course, the first response was, what do you mean? It's just a seatbelt and a door not alignment. So what happened is I said, well, we got a problem. You're in Las Vegas, this car's in Seattle. How do you want to handle this? And he goes, well, I don't know. He says, we want an opportunity to fix it. I said, really, okay. So I said, I'll tell you what, I'll meet with you personally if you can get the car from Seattle to Las Vegas and have it there next week, which is this week. So let me tell you how my day started. I jumped up, walked out of my hotel room, jumped in an Uber. How many of you guys have got an Uber in this town yet? These people drive like crazy, don't they? It's pretty cool. Anyhow, we went down to the shop, took one look, and I walked up to him and I said, um, so you got the car here, and um, are you ready to buy the car? He says, no, there's nothing wrong with it. I'm an iCar certified platinum, individual. Well, first of all, that's no such thing, but that's okay. And then he goes, and we do everything right. And I had my best technician look at the car with me. Everything's fine on this car. I said, okay, well, let's go out and take a look. And this is a OEM certified shop, by the way, not for Toyota, but other brands. I go out there and take one look at it. And I said, and we opened up the door and I pulled the weather strips off. And we noticed that there was a whole bunch of welds 
they were holding the unicide on. They replaced the rocker, the B-pillar, the quarter panel, and all that. But the welds were really small and had a kind of a triangular look to them. And I looked on the backside, and there was no backside. Like, it wasn't a squeeze-type weld. It was a single-sided weld on this entire unicide of this car. We then went to the OEM information to see what they said. We know what they said. They said that you have to use squeeze-type welds and you have to use the right, correct welding wire. So I said, let's go look at your welders, because that's how I am. Let's just go check out your equipment. So we walked in, and they had a smart welder. And the smart welder actually, uh, I said, no, I see your smart welder. Where's the actual arms that would clamp and the tips would be there? He goes, I don't know where those are. I'm not a technician. And this is a true story happened this morning. So then he asked his technician, Joe, or whoever it was, and he says, oh, I don't know where that is. We, we don't use those. You can't make this up. So I'm talking to the technician now, and the technician says, yeah, we just, we, it's a one-sided spot because it's a smart welder. <laughs> now, you got to get, this is the, somebody looking me in the eyes. How many of you guys have that 30-year technician in your shop, or you know who I'm talking about? That's this guy. Now, I could say that this is a Las Vegas story. This is a collision repair industry story. And, you know, for those of you that get out into shops like we do, and we're in hundreds of shops all over the United States, this is really real. So, you know, I, and I, as I walked out of there, I was talking to Spring. Many of you met Spring in the back of the room. So wave Spring. Everybody's going to look at you. But the bottom line is, I said, you know what? We probably saved five lives today because that's a wife, a husband, and three kids. Because thank God that seatbelt didn't work and the light was on and she wound up at a dealer and we got to look at this thing so that shop could buy the car. Well, I, I, and, and needless to say, at the end of the game, what do you think the manager um, had the opinion of? I think I'm going to buy this car. But I said, here's the problem. You're going to buy this car and then you're going to turn around and put it on your car lot and you're going to sell it to somebody else and I'm going to be on these freeways. You got to buy this car and crush it or buy this car and fix it right. Of course, he didn't want to talk to me very much after that. And then my Uber arrived, and I came back here. But I, want, I invite you guys to consider that with the advanced steels we have, and we got a fantastic panel, but I invite you guys to consider that with all this technology and all this stuff we have going on, we got to get back to the basics. Because the basics, and this is welding. We've been welding cars for a long time. This is not just another panel to sit through and get through. And the, the, the sad part is, is that there's 35,000 shops that should be in this room hearing this message. Because if you walked in the back of most shops, you're going to see what I saw today. And this is all about having people not die. So if we take on today like this, so there's three ways you can participate in this panel today. And I invite everybody to consider that maybe you're not on the stage, but you are a participant in this panel. So one way is, you know, if you got your favorite sports team and you watch it on TV and, you know, you can get up, go to the bathroom, grab a sandwich and come back and catch the replay. That's one way to participate in a sporting event. Everybody agree with that? Another way to get a little more involved in the sporting event is to actually go to the game. Now, you're generally not going to go sit in the hallway and use the restroom during the exciting part of the game. And there's another way to play a game. And the other way to play the game is to actually play it on the court. Like, you're the one that is on the line in football, or you're the one that's, uh, you know, uh, jumping up and doing the different things. I mean, you're the goalie. You're actually in the game. I guarantee you, you're not like, hey, I got to grab a sandwich. I'm cool. I'll catch the replay. Because the team is counting on you to be on the court. I invite you guys to consider that the collision repair industry today is, in, is counting on you to be on the court so that you can take this message out to whoever you have influence over. We got a ton of people in the press in the front row. You know, this, this panel could be just kind of a fun thing. We got, you know, Dave, Dave promised he would track some good jokes, right, Dave? But the, oh, wait, you guys wait if you've never seen Dave Gruce goes. But the reality is, is that I invite you to consider that this is a matter of life and death because if we can do everything right, we can reset the ADAS, we can do the alignment, we can make the paint match, but if we don't actually get the welds right on every car, every time, the first time, that people can die. How many of you would wanna watch it like a TV show 
or how many of you are willing to be in this room this afternoon for the next two hours and actually be on the court for the consumer, be the ambassador? Raise your hands. Okay, all three of you. Now, everybody raise your right hand. Everybody. Okay, now I know it works. Let me ask the question again. How many of you guys are willing to be on the court this afternoon? Awesome. That said, everybody here is on the court, so everybody here is on the panel. Do you guys get that? And I want you to treat everybody that's coming up and being part of this panel as your partner in collision repair. You know, we've got manufacturers here, we've got equipment tool suppliers, we've got I I different experts. Don't hesitate to walk up and ask the question or be part of the solution. So that said, I'm gonna bring up the first one. And what we're gonna do in this panel, we're gonna bring up individuals. They're gonna give you the slice from their perspective in their world. As soon as they do that, they're gonna sit down. At the, as soon as they've kind of laid the foundation, then we're gonna actually start the panel. So that said, I'm gonna introduce Sean Hart from Audi of America. Sean's got all kinds of great things to say. And Sean, you remember that panel we started with six people this morning? Now your panel is 200 people that you get to play with today. That said, Sean Hart for the Audi. Uh, all right, well first off, I wanna start with a, just a quick PSA. I am not a welding engineer. So most of the time with German manufacturers, a lot of time uh, we get stuff given to us. Um, all of our welding equipment that's specified in our catalog, uh, what we specify in our repair instructions, all gets handed to us from Germany. They say, this is what we've tested, this is what you're going to use. So it makes it easy, at least for me. Um, we do have a lot of times in our equipment proprietary software, we make adjustments to different things, so having the right equipment is key. It even says in all of our repair instructions that you must use one of the approved pieces of equipment in order to make the repair. It's pretty straightforward, cut and dry, black and white, whatever you wanna call it. Now with spot welding, because we rely most of the time on the equipment manufacturers to do the training with the technicians, the training with the shops on how to use these pieces of equipment, we focus more in our training on the procedure side of things. So we look at how, which is just as important as knowing how to use the piece of equipment, is how to prep the car and the panels in order to weld that piece back on. So during our training, we focus on, we break it down into two categories for the technicians. So this works. Uh, we start with category one, which is the car side of things. So when making a repair, technician cuts off the damaged panel, he has a number of things he has to do in order to prep the panel or the car side of the, of the equation in order to make sure that when he puts the new panel on, it's going to stay on. And it's pretty cut and dry. If you are spot welding or MIG welding steel, uh, we ask that the technician cleans both sides of the flange to bare metal, clean it, and then apply a weld through primer. And of course, being a German manufacturer, we specify which weld through primer that we want you to use. And of course, it has a part number, it comes from the Audi dealer, and that's what they use. If you're MIG welding aluminum, different story. We ask that the technicians clean both sides of the panel 100%. Must be 100% clean, and that's just one of the finicky things about welding aluminum, which we know a little bit about. The other part of the equation, then, becomes the new part side. So with the new part, it looks very familiar. With spot welding and MIG welding steel, we clean both sides of the flange to bare metal, and then we apply weld through primer. So we specify basically that you have to have everything clean with weld through primer on it before you weld the panels together, uh, both with steel and then with aluminum again, same thing. We're 100% clean down to bare aluminum. Now, of course, because Germany tells us these are the welders that we've tested, these are the welders that you're going to use. Uh, currently, right now, in our tool and equipment catalog, we have four uh, welders that have been approved. Uh, the VAS 6755, uh, 208, 208, not 2008. Uh, VAS 821, 101, 
uh, VAS 6530A and VAS 6545A. So shops out there that are joining our program that are out there looking to buy the equipment, they do have options. It's not that we're saying that they have to only get, you know, they have one choice and that's it. They have a choice of four. Uh, so we give that out there to them and those are in the catalog. When it comes to spot welding, and again, because we're focusing on the procedure side of things, we've got the prep portion down, but we always add that little tidbit of you need to do test welds. And a lot of guys will ask, well, why do I need to do test welds? The machine's smart, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. As long as it has both arms on it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so in our repair information, we actually have a test weld document. Uh, it's called the button test. And so it has, and unfortunately because it is German, it has a fairly large equation that goes with how you determine the size, here, the size of the button that you need to have when you actually pull the spot weld. Um, and it's taking the thinnest piece of the material that you're welding together, whatever sheet that is. Um, in the example that I have up there that I did at our training facility, the panel was 0.8 of a millimeter. Okay, you take that, you times it by 3.5, and then you times that by 1.15, and then you take the square root of it. I'm not making this up, <clears throat> it is actually documented. Uh, that came out to be that I should, when I peel the panels back, I should have a 3.6 millimeter hole, which you can see in my example there, I had. So I know at that point when I do that test weld, the welder is well working properly. Now, of course, again, when we get to the equipment, we expect or assume that technicians that are coming in who have these pieces of equipment because we specify they have to have them, have gotten trained by the tool and equipment companies that supply them, um, and they know how they need to maintain them and they know when they need to change caps, uh, when they need to make adjustments, um, so we kind of leave that portion out of the equation. We do talk about it a little bit when technicians ask questions, but it is one of those things that we, we kind of expect they should know when they get there. Now, of course, this started kind of out uh, when, we, when I got in, in, in asked to do this. It was more about spot welding, but I said, hey, can we just talk about welding in general? And everybody was like, yeah, we can do that. Uh, so I, we also have two MIG welders that are currently in our catalog. Um, that are both smart welders, VAS 821-003 and VAS 821-005. Those are our two MIG welders that we specify. Currently at this moment, we do not uh, specify that you have to have a specific MIG welder for welding steel. Do not. We do for aluminum, which is one of these two. Uh, but I will tell you from my experience and from what I'm seeing in our catalog with the tools and equipment, that at some point here in the near future, we are going to specify that you have to have one of these welders for welding steel. And a lot of that is due to the new steels that we're getting into the vehicle, in the vehicles, lighter weight, stronger, and they need special processes in order to be able to weld them. So that's where we're at with Audi, and uh, I'll give it back to Mark. So thank you, Sean. So let me ask a question of somebody, and, and, and I apologize, but for those of you that have ever been up on a stage and you got a spotlight that's in your eyes, I can't see you. I can see there's people out there, but I can't actually see you. So has anybody in this room uh, never fixed a car or never welded on a car? Just go ahead and raise your hands real quick. Okay, what's your name? Hillary. Can I volunteer you real quick? I've never done this before. So Hillary, and thank, everybody give Hillary a round of applause. And second of all, you see what I'm talking about, the spotlights? Yeah. yeah, now you can't see anybody, can you? Okay, so I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions. Okay, so the first question is, is that if I take 20 bolts out of your suspension, how many bolts you want me to put back in? She wants 20, who wants to fix her car? She's, she's kinda picky. Okay, how many, now let me ask another question. So you want them all in, I get that, that's cool, okay. How many do you actually want to be tight? All of them? Yeah. So can you guys get, can, can you see, did you, did you guys see your face? She's looking at me like, all of them? Like, why, what a stupid question. 
right? That was kind of what you were thinking, right? Okay, we've never met before, right? Okay, how's she doing, guys? Pretty good? Okay. Let me ask you the next question. I take 20 welds out of your car, which is kind of like a bolt. It's what's holding your car together. How many do you want me to put back in? All of them. She wants all of them back in, okay? And how many of them do you want to be the correct strength so that it actually holds your car together? All of them. Wow. Now, would you guys consider this is like any consumer you might have come into your shop? Okay, so I invite you guys to consider that this conversation is about her driving her car and her expectation that she wants all the welds in that need to be there and all of them have, have to be the proper strength. And you're counting that, aren't you? Because you, you can't actually see the welds because they're all covered by paint and all that, right? Okay, so would you guys all take on that we're having this conversation about her and her family such that in another collision, she survives? Everybody good with that? Okay, let's give her a round of applause. Well, and it's kind of like, how many of you uh, were at uh, CIC and you saw the Sebashans, Matthew and Marsha? Now, if you weren't there, it's, it, was re it was video recorded, it's gonna be online, but there is no way you could have walked out of that room and not had a pit in your stomach if you're at any level that you went, oh my gosh, this, that's really, really real. Just so you know, for those of you who don't know who the Sebashans are, they're the ones that were involved in the car in the John Eagle lawsuit. They actually brought the people that got burned up in the car actually and put them on stage. It was pretty moving and it was videoed so you guys would be able to see it. Okay, that said, we're gonna move along. Thank you, Sean. So the next person we're gonna um, uh, have come up here is uh, my good buddy, Steve Marks, and he's with iCar. And he spends the one, he, and he's the one that uh, comes up and trains all the people and does all that kind of cool stuff. I'm not gonna tell you who he is, uh, but no further ado, Steve Marks with iCar. Oh, that light is bright. I know, I know. <laughs> all right, thanks everybody. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna, my, my next few slides, um, I'm, I'm the trainer for Jaguar, um, as, as uh, Mark said, I actually work for, uh, for iCar. However, we are, we are uh, contracted by Jaguar Land Rover to do all the training for their collision repair network. And uh, so I actively uh, were, was trained and I now train the technicians uh, to be certified for aluminum and for steel. So what I'm gonna do is give you kind of an overview of what that is and what we look for and I thought that could uh, also give you some insight throughout the panel discussion when I can help on what you may have, what we find as, as the biggest problems that people have achieving these weld uh, certifications, okay? So um, starting out, uh, let's see. Um, just as an overview, okay, like uh, we do all this training at the ICAR Tech Center. Um, and uh, even though, like I said, it's Jaguar Land Rover, we're doing it at the Tech Center. That's the only place that we're doing it in North America. So we do North America and Canada and uh, occasionally get some other folks in, but um, ours is the only training center. Uh, we've been doing this since 2004. And, uh, and I said myself and two other trainers uh, have been trained by Jaguar Land Rover to uh, deliver this training. And unlike a lot of the, um, the training, we call it training, however, to the Brits, um, they impress us it's more of a weld assessment. Um, their, um, their expectation when people come to these uh, sessions is that they are already accomplished welding or um, welders. Um, we find that although that is, their, that, is, that is the way they wanna run it, however, we find that uh, we like to do a lot of coaching. So when they're actually taking the test, because they get one shot, the, 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 the program's either four, if it's a reassessment, it's four days long. If it's a, if it's, it's the first time around, then it's five days, right? And so when they go all week and practice, we run them through all these wells and they have to weld coupons and so on and so forth. But when it's all done on Friday, they got one shot on it. And uh, that can get pretty tense. So we try to coach people and get them ready for that, okay? Um, we have right now, we have over 400 technicians that are involved in this. Um, so um, I do like 42 weeks a year just for Jaguar Land Rover. So um, we do quite a bit of that, all right? And it's two technicians per shop right now. And the network is growing, um, you know, quite rapidly. So 
Um, what I'm going to do is I'll show you what the aluminum is. I'll show you what the steel is and then kind of give you a little background. Basically, this is the assembly that the technicians have to build. They build it out of three-piece uh, aluminum, um, aluminum panels. Uh, it's constructed in class. It's 1.5 millimeter thick, all three panels are. Um, what you're seeing there on the right is a butt joint um, with backing, and it needs to be done. You can only stop once. You'll start at the bottom edge and work your way up, go around all those profiles, yes, around corners, and not stop. And then you'll get to the top, the very first 90, you can stop for a second, reposition, pull the trigger, and keep going. And a lot of people that are, you know, welding purists would say, like, well, that's really not maybe how I should do that. Shouldn't I heat control it and start and stop? It is a skills test. And quite honestly, um, when you see somebody do it correctly, it really, you look and go like, well, what's wrong with that? You know, it really works pretty well, but it just, it's a little tricky. Um, and the welds to the left of that, it's a lap joint with three fillet welds. That used to be a continuous weld, and that was probably the most difficult one, but they have now changed it. Instead of pulling the trigger and running the whole thing in one shot, it is now three separate uh, fillet welds on a, on a lap. Makes it a little easier. Um, and then what you have is the plug welds on either side of that butt joint, okay? And those are with a 10 millimeter hole. Um, what we are looking for are no skips, no restrikes. If it looks like somebody stopped and covered it up, um, that would be a fail. Um, and, it's, uh, and all of the coupons that they do, in other words, they have to do all these wells in flat vertical overhead, all the coupons, all of those are photographed front and back, you know? So it's, it's really, you know, like obviously, you know, after you work with a technician all week, um, if he looks at it and there's an issue, I mean, it's kind of a, it's very difficult for us because you want everybody to pass. Unfortunately, the way this works, the photo is the photo, the weld is the weld. Um, so, and I'm going to show you how we document that in just a minute. Um, it is also um, rivet bonded. So you're seeing a combination of the skill of putting in SPRs and, and blind rivets. Um, and it's done with and without adhesive. And basically, they're given a diagram, so they have to put this together, put the right amount of welds, um, SPRs, and, and, uh, and blind rivets in. Okay, so that's for the, uh, the aluminum side of it. Um, on the steel side of it, just imagine the steel part looks like what you just saw in aluminum. And what I did is I, I got it a little bit closer for you, so I kind of just took pieces of it to show you. Um, you're looking on the left side is a open butt joint done with silicon bronze MIG, okay? Um, and so what you're seeing on the left side, the upper and lower to your left, the upper one obviously is the outside of the weld, and the lower part is the photo from the inside of the weld. Um, we are doing that, I would call that in stitch continuous. So we're basically the technician starts on the bottom, pulls the trigger, hits it for three seconds, like lets it cool, hits it again, lets it cool, hits it again, all the way up. Now, I know there's other ways of welding, but that's the only way that we found effective to get a no flaw back, as you see in the lower left, without, you look on the back, it looks like somebody welded it from the inside. And, and the spec is, it has to be a minimum of 0.5 feet height, maximum of 1.5, so they've got to hit that. And all around the corners, there can't be any flaws. On, and I'm sorry, I said to, my, to your left is the MIG braze, I'm sorry. It's to the right. Um, I just with the lights on, it looked a little off to me. So, so basically, the right side you're seeing is the silicon bronze. Those sort of oval shaped, those are slots, okay? Those are slot wells. So those are MIG braze slots, which are done in a continuous motion. Um, there's a number of different ways we allow it to be done. The main thing we are trying to achieve there is get it as flat as possible, absolutely no skips, and a minimal burn on the backside, which you don't see right there. It's, it, you know, I didn't show you a picture of that. However, what we want to do is, is the objective, uh, objective there is picture putting a lower strength steel panel onto a high strength steel structure that is very heat sensitive. So we're always trying to remind people that they're trying to control heat. That's why on the steel side, that's why the training is being done. People go like, oh, it's only steel. Hey, it's a big deal, right? Because some of the steels are very heat sensitive. So what you're seeing on the right side, once again, that is the silicon bronze. You're on the left side, you're seeing a very similar type of weld. That is done with steel electrode wire, same process, 
hit it, let it cool, hit it, let it cool. But the part that really throws people when they come to weld this program, they go like, hey, I've been welding steel for a long time, this shouldn't be too bad. However, to my knowledge, I don't know of any OE, if you look on the bottom left, this is the bottom left, I don't know of any OEM that requires a minimum, I'm saying minimum, of one millimeter height bead on the inside and it can't have any flaws when you're all done. So when you're looking at the left upper, it looks really nice on the outside, but you have to like, we cut that part open and on the inside there can't be any flaws. Um, we have a much higher fail rate on the steel weld than we do on the silicon bronze. Um, just because people are not used to getting that type of penetration. And when you are welding like that, it's really easy to burn a hole and burn it up. So it takes a little bit of a, a knack to get that. Um, the plug wells that they're tested on have only a five millimeter hole, which guys are a little, not quite used to that. Some people are still thinking like, well, every time we do a plug well, it's eight millimeter. Um, but Jaguar Land Rover, like a lot of the other OEMs, on a lot of panels, on the thinner panels, they're using smaller holes. And, um, you know, so, this, so the, this is actually a five millimeter hole, which is even a little smaller if, than the punch that you would have would be like for a quarter inch six five. And the process in order to make that pass, basically what you're doing is you're taking your torch, holding it right in the center and pulling the trigger and not moving it. A lot of techs go, I want to go around, right? No, you can't. You got to stay right in the middle and pull the trigger because you only have an instant while that weld is forming. And if you move it, it deflects the focus of the heat too much and you have to get like a bump on the back. I'm going to say melt through. So um, you need a, a minimum of 0.5. So that one's a little bit tricky. Uh, as well. Um, but anyway, so that's it for that. Um, and now on to resistance welding because I understand and I totally agree this is really important. And probably the thing that I'm kind of most discouraged about when I do this training is that when we talk about we have um, we have classroom session and shop obviously, you know. So, um, you know, when we do when we talk about MIG brazing, everybody's, you know, they all perk up and they go, wow, this is cool. I haven't done much of that. You know, and it for, basically we first start talking about steel and people are going like, yeah, whatever. Then they go down to the shop and go like, oh my God, what do I have to do with this? So then they kind of get a little more, they start listening a little bit more. But what, what is discouraging to me, when we talk about spot welding, it's sort of they're really interested in, we're really interested in the, uh, um, in, in the steel, in, really interested in MIG brazing. However, when we get to spot welding, they kind of go like, they start yawning and going like, man, this is like, all I gotta do is turn a machine on and set it and pull a trigger and I'm all done. And, and I really honestly feel like there's nothing further uh, from the truth. I really find that um, I think spot welding um, doesn't get enough focus. I don't think that people realize, a lot of the techs um, realize that if they don't, um, you know, if they don't clean it correctly. Um, and, and actually when I went to the certification over in the UK, um, one thing that trainer um, really dr drove home is that the people that I was certifying with, we built the we built the panel like this, welded it all together, and we thought we did pretty good. And uh, the trainer wasn't in the room when we were doing it. He came in, he's going, "Well, mates, I see you've got that all welded together." And uh, yeah, those welds look a little bit small. I'm assuming you all, you all didn't measure those, right? You all measured the nugget, and we're kind of looking at each other like, "No," you know. And as it turned out, we all had produced welds that were about six millimeters, six, two, six, three, and they want, and I'm just saying this, I'm not saying this, everybody needs this, but Jaguar Land Rover specifies the weld must be between seven and 8.4 millimeter in, you know, the, the width of it. And, and if, if you don't know that, or if you don't weld to that spec, it's incorrect. And we actually find it's a little tricky, um, and, and probably some of you know this, maybe some of you don't, but um, it's a little more difficult sometimes to get a larger well on a thin stack than it is on a thick stack. Thinks a thick stack will compress a little bit more, there's more resistance, more resistance is more heat. And sometimes it's a lot easier to get a bigger well, but if you've got a really thin stack and, and you're only getting six and you try to bring it up to seven, especially seven, five, it can be a little tricky. And I'm just saying if you're in the smart mode, now I'm not saying that's the wrong thing, but I'm just saying this is an instance where when you're welding on a vehicle, you need to weld to their spec, if you like it or not, or agree with it or not. And, 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 if, you, and if you don't measure the nugget, I'm seeing on the Jaguar, uh, Jaguar Land Rover side, it is incorrect if it's too small. Um, so we found that basically Jaguar Land Rover, what they want you to do is they want you to set your settings manually 
and then monitor them and measure them and basically set the machine to achieve the spec. So, um, so when our techs are you know, going in there, that's what we, we spend some time on them. What, is, what do the settings do and what are they? And believe me, I'm not saying that the smart mode isn't good. I'm not saying you should never do that. But if you do have like an OEM, and I know some of the OEMs require you to set manually, then I think you really need to do that because I'm sure they got their reason for it. So with that said, um, the thing that um, I'm just looking to see if I, oh, and for equipment, uh, on the Jaguar Land Rover side, what they do, rather than saying um, you need like this specific machine, they're a little more open onto what they do is give you a spec. Um, the spec is 500 decanewtons minimum and 12, uh, uh, you know, 12,000 amps minimum. So if it falls within that and hits some of the other specs, then, then it's typically um, allowable. Um, we, uh, we weld with and without adhesive. Uh, there are some areas that are well bonded, some are not. Um, there is also the case of, um, in our training, we talk about do you weld on the weld or weld next to it? And I'm sure during this panel discussion, we'll be talking about that a little bit. And the main thing that we stress, and, and Sean did a great job talking about that, is surface prep, right? One thing I, I heard quite, quite a long time ago, um, I heard one salesman uh, talking to another one. And when I say salesman, I don't mean that in a bad way. I think these guys really knew what they're talking about. But somebody said, sir, does your welding equipment weld through um, E-coat? Because we really believe we want to leave the E-coat on. He said, my machine will weld through E-coat just as well as everyone else's, else's does. Very badly with a lot of porosity, you know. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and, and that's kind of the case where, like, we always want to weld through, you know, materials. And it's like, if you're told to weld through a, um, a product, that's fine, right? If it's an adhesive or weld through primer and so, and so on and so forth. But I, once again, I would not want to re-engineer it. Uh, Jaguar Land Rover also requires bare metal all the way around. We get bare metal in the flanges, inside, outside, all the way through, use well through primer. And also um, really watch the electrodes as, as uh, Sean had said. Um, the electrode condition and maintenance, and the other thing too, and I'm sure you've heard all this, shop wiring is a big deal, and also making and documenting uh, test wells. Uh, no matter how much you test uh, trust the machine, we just really believe it's always important to, uh, to do test wells as well. And um, so one thing, I'm just, I'm just about done here, but I, I thought it would be interesting for you to know, um, when we have the certification uh, process, one thing we do is that we are kind of under watch by the Brits over, uh, we call it global, UK global, JLR. Um, we send all of our welding files every week. Uh, actually, it's not true, we do them every week, but once a month we send all of the weld files to them. And, and what you're seeing, and I know this is really difficult for you to, to make out what this is, but on your right, all of those tiny little thumbnails, um, that is a steel welding test. There are two, there's upper lower of the steel butt joint, upper and lower of the MIG brace, one of the inner, um, one of the uh, spot weld that's torn, the slot on the inner and the slot on the outer, every one of those. And the little box to your, that would be, um, you know, to your right, um, that is the pass block, and the one, and, and then, and then the one right next to that is as we don't use the word fail, we call it refer, and and what it amounts to is each one of those are are like evaluated and they're very high resolution. So if you click on it, you can open up a lot and uh, and see it, you know, very clearly. So and then the bottom, um, the bottom box that has no photo, that's where the technician's photo goes. And so for steel and for aluminum, this is it and that, and that stays with him. And for the recert, the, he starts with a five day and then after that, it's a recertification every three years. And that's his file, you know? I mean, it's very difficult to pass a test like this, but once you get it, I mean, I really feel like the industry should go more toward this kind of a thing where it's like, this is a professional. Um, he, you know, obviously he just did it on that day. Would he do it every day? I don't know, but at least you know the skill was there. Um, and you know, it's, it, it, and, and so we are under the gun of, uh, under the watchful eye of GLR Global. And, uh, and that's it. Um, what you see on the left, um, basically your left, is just an example of an inner steel well that's cut open. You probably can't see it very well, but 
there's just little check marks on it. And there's a couple of flaws pointed out and we have to mark everything, document it, take a photo of it. And then the description would be um, in the little box. And if we have any little checks, there has to be a description. And if there's more than a couple of little checks with, well, here's a tiny flaw, but it's okay. If we have a tiny little flaw and another tiny little flaw and another tiny flaw, and we still let it pass, we'll be getting a phone call. So um, they watch it pretty closely. So this is kind of what um, I'm gonna say, that's kind of my world and that what I've been doing. Um, and just in, 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 uh, in closing, um, I know that one thing we wanted to talk about in this group is like, what do we see as trainers? I'm gonna say what I can see in Sean. What are, our, what are our number one problems? Number one, I've got at the top of the list, eyesight deficiency, where people just come in and text that are working every day. We'll go like, hey, do you need glasses? And they go well, like, no, I'm fine. Like, can you read? You know, well, yeah, I'm okay. And like, you know, I'm the same way. I'm like holding out here. And, and I said like, realize when you're welding, you're welding, you know, here's your eye, you're about that close. If a person needs like, I'm gonna say reading glasses with um, about a two power, down here, right about there, you should need a three power. So we get an awful lot of guys, we'll watch them welding, their weld gets a little crooked. And we'll go like, hey buddy, can you see? Okay, yeah, I'm good. Here, try these on once. Oh, wow, does that help? And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, yeah, we're good, you know? So we have a lot of reading glasses we pass out, right? And, uh, and it helps. Um, the other issue is not steady, right? We're all like, you know, either too much coffee or as we get older, it's a little harder to, you know, hold. So we do a lot of coaching on how, to, how people can overcome, you know, their, their issues. You know, like I mean, people are not steady, can't see well. What we try to do is work people through that and it really a lot of that helps, you know. Um, the other thing I think in the collision business, none of us, myself included initially, we never had formal training for welding. You know, and a lot of the guys say, man, I'm here for a week. I weld like 1% of the time. All the rest of the time, I'm fitting panels. I'm, I'm like, you know, doing, um, you know, disassembly, assembly. I'm fitting panels. I'm doing structural repair. And actual gun on time, I don't really have that much time in welding. And at the same time, very few people have had formal training. But I think maybe over in Europe, there was a little more of that. Uh, the other thing we run into is resistance and change where people are used to welding a certain way. And we say, hey, you know, maybe somebody tells you to pull the trigger and run a straight bead. And that's good, that's cool if you can do that. But to get this spec, here's how we gotta do it. And see, some people just go like, nah, I just can't change, you know? And so we run into a little bit of that. And the other thing we run into is lack of understanding of what welding settings do. Like when I change the amps, what does that do? Voltage. And there's a lot of misinformation and people don't know what they're doing. So we try to help them with that. And then the other thing is lack of uh, just not being aware of that, you know, how you weld on one car is not the same as you weld on another. Um, so uh, what you're seeing there um, <clears throat> on the right-hand side is just an example of the specifications of the steel, which is the, um, you know, you're seeing the notice there on the A where it says root penetration is one to three and all the way across. So basically the technicians after they come to the training know every weld, know every spec and know what to do with it, okay? And with that, um, I thank you for that and look forward to the panel, thanks. Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, so isn't this an amazingly riveting subject of welding? That was a joke, Dave, come on, help me out here, no. Um, so I'm, I'm going to kind of pick up the tempo here a little bit. I know it's uh, late in the afternoon and you guys want to get to the slot. Somebody's got to pay the, uh, the light bill. How many of you guys are up? How many of you guys are down? How many of you don't gamble during SEMA? Thank you. <laughs> okay. So the, the, the next thing is I want to, I want to jump in and I'm just going to ask one really quick question of Sean and, um, and Steve real quick. And I don't want a long answer. I want a quick answer. When people walk into your training facility, on a percentage level, how many people do you think could pass the test without any training as they walk into your facility? Um, I would say 30%. 30%, okay, Sean? I would say maybe 20%. Okay, so if you can get that, you see how specific that is, that in the industry, shops aren't gonna send their worst welders, they're gonna send their best welders, and of that, 20 to 30% of them could probably be okay in this. The sad part is 70 to 80% aren't 
aren't. Is that an issue potentially in our industry? Is this an important topic to have her survive? Well, you, I'm going to bring it right back to you. We're not done yet. Okay. So, come on, if I can make my clicker work. Next slide, somebody. Back up. Okay. So, I'm going to talk, I'll bring up Dave with uh, Reliable. Dave is a funny guy. I think he missed his calling. He's actually should have been a comedian. No further ado, Dave Gruss goes with Reliable. <laughs> Okay, this is a serious issue. Um, you're gonna probably get an epiphany from our presentation. If there's a flash, it's the reflection off my head from these lights. Oh my, it's killing me. Um, anyway, I'm Dave Gruskis from Reliable Automotive Equipment. I'm gonna make this quick and sweet because your questions are supposed to be to the panel. We've been around for 30 years, next. We're working with different welders. Uh, most of the welders now are actually have changed because the technology has changed around what's required. Um, the manufacturers have made some complex changes in their metal combinations, and the welders uh, in return are changing as well as the programs. So if you do have something that's older and living up with these new metals, it, you gotta update. Change your scribe, please. So the complex vehicle changes, complex changes in technology, uh, quick response is required by our engineers because the uh, um, vehicles are changing very quick, mid-model year, et cetera. You're seeing on uh, US car makers, all of a sudden we're now working with three layers of a thin layer of a mild steel, uh, high resistance steel, is, and then an ultra hard steel like a boron are together. So all of a sudden, a guy's going to make a weld, and the thin sheet is just exploding. The Japanese car makers, it's almost the exact same thing. A paper-thin, mild sheet going to a harder metal to a harder metal. So how do you get to weld these different combinations? You're going to have spot welders that when you actually pull the trigger, there'll be a smart welder with a specific program in it to that car company. It'll make up to five pulses. This is all done in the thousandths of a second. You don't even really see what's going on, but there's a lot of technology going into it. You're gonna see companies now require specific software put in their welders with their certification. This happens to be showing a GM update going into a welder. These happen to be like what the perfect looking MIG weld now is on the boron steel to the thinner sheets. When it's cut from the side during the testing, as Sean Hart brought up, this is actually one of the test pieces. When something is now done with MIG brazing with the copper silesium wire, this is what it's supposed to look like when it's cut from the side. So if your weld is some little beads splattered all over the place, it's not the right way. And if you notice, the back side is actually bigger than the front side. A lot of guys, we they say we have our MIG welding wire, and we have our aluminum wire, and here is our copper or our uh, MIG brazing wire. Right now, we have 20 different wires going out on a daily basis. So if you're using aluminum and you did your iCar test, and now you're gonna weld a car, it's the wrong wire. If you did a car with aluminum wire and you try to do your iCar blanks, it doesn't work because it's a different wire. Uh, you have to know your OEM's repair statements and position statements, and they'll tell you what the proper products are to be used. I'm just ending the slide with a quick rivet gun because obviously equally to welding, we're going into rivet guns. But the technology we're gonna be talking about today is very changed and specific to the OEs. Um, you know, we we're talking about JLR just now. JLR is going through extensive testing with the computer programs on our spot welders. Um, GM has gone through extensive testing. When a car company's testing these welders, we don't physically say, you know, here our welder works good. In a lot of cases, they take our welder, they'll test it. They will might test it for six months, they might test it for six years. Um, there's a lot that goes into before you see the approval sticker put on it. And in some cases, that actual welder gets locked away at that company until they're ready to do another round of testing. So with that, 
I am finished. We're going to keep moving and get to the next person, which is Bob. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say something about that real quick. So one of the things, I, I had an opportunity today, so you probably noticed that General Motors is absent from the panel. Um, you guys might have noticed or heard that there was a small little thing called a strike with General Motors. So Jason uh, Mako was supposed to be here. He said, I can't travel. But I did have an opportunity to talk to him and uh, Jose Mil uh, Villanueva. And so a couple things that Dave just said, I wanted to just bring to the forefront with General Motors. So General Motors, they specify certain welders be used. And those certain welders are brought in, they're tested, they are, they're, they're put through the ranks. And if they're on their list, they're, uh, they're approved. And if they're not on the list, which is on their, their parts and tool equipment, it's not approved. And then as a new model comes out, they have to go back and retest every one of them one more time to make sure it's still approved and they might fall back off the list. So if it's on the um, list for General Motors, it'll work for today and going backwards, but it may not work tomorrow depending on what type of steels they put on cars and et cetera. And that is constantly changing. The other thing that Dave talked about, I wanted to point out is they have a software update so it may not be you buy a new welder, but you do have to get the software update. So the old days of, I got a welder, it's in the corner, it's always welded the different pieces of the car together, may not be appropriate for the specific vehicle that you're working on. So I just wanted to bring a little slice of General Motors into this, and we're gonna see more of that from the, the automakers. So next up is uh, Robert Heiser with Spinazzi Americas. Robert, what you got? Good afternoon, I'll try to be short with this. Uh, um, while he won't admit it now, he said, Bob, we've got all kinds of time. Take whatever time you need. Uh, clearly, he doesn't know me. So, of course, just a little bit about me because you deserve to know what's going on. Um, February 4th of this year, I left General Motors um, on a retirement, which was the end of a really wonderful era. Get me back to my first slide here. Let me see. So now I work for uh, Tim Morgan. It's been easy. What you're looking at here is our two, our two welders. The the one on the on your left is the 14500, which is a 14500 amp uh, fully automatic resistance spot welder, and the one on on your right is the Q5 three gun MIG. It welds, of course, steel, silicon, bronze, and aluminum. Um, so I just wanted to put that in there. So the materials that we are welding have changed. Um, as a GM employee, I was there 30 years. I was always involved in collision repair. I'm not here to speak on behalf of General Motors in any way, but I will tell you about some of my experiences I've had as a service engineer there. In the 90s, we had only a few types of steel. We were starting to see stuff like um, dual phase. Uh, they were lower KPA strength steels compared to today. And uh, now we have many types of steels. We're now welding through um, electro-galvanized and hop-dip galvanized steels, and that changes the welding dynamic, especially in a resistance spot welding situation. Um, we're also seeing, of course, two, we've always seen two and three layer welds, but sometimes in some OEs, you're gonna see some four layer welding. Um, I know what, in my experience, with at least with GM, um, they try to resist in their designs a, a four layer because it sometimes can be problematic for them and the plant, um, but they will do that if they need to. Uh, we're dealing with ultra high sink steel, ultra high strength steel and advanced high strength steel. Uh, and then there's gonna be the next generation of advanced high strength steel. Um, just before I left uh, General Motors, they were coming out with the new Silverado. And that truck has a roll form 1500 KPA uh, Martin Siddick rocker inner. Um, would you agree the rocker's kind of a high traffic area in a collision shop? Yeah. Yeah, you gotta put the whole thing in. Don't straighten that. Take it out. So I went to the metallurgist and I asked him, I says, why? Why can't I just straighten that? He says, Bob, roll form Martin Siddick happens when we form the part. It arrives as its final properties when the part is finally made into its sh the shape that we send to the plant to be assembled to the truck. When you bend it, you change it. When you change it, we no longer know what it will do. I want that to sink in because you own that now. As a technician, I own that now. So that's what we're faced with in this industry. Never before has it been more important 
to the understanding of what our materials are that we're working with. Because if you just pull it around and leave it and send it and go on, we don't know if that's going to affect airbag timing. I promise you the OEs are going to tell you about what to do with these steels. You really need to know what that is. So these are the expectations that have changed. Obviously, that well, this is my first slide. Found it. Cool. So these are just some of the things I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, I'll get through this quickly because I don't need you to spend a whole lot of time on that. But what I got here is a little bit about, you know, I'm a visual guy. I'm an artist. I'm a pinstriper and a custom painter, and I love to see the pictures. I, You know, I've always been a picture book kind of kid. I do know how to read. I can write. But <laughs> I'm just being facetious here. But when I, when I went to the Auto Steel Partnership uh, meetings every year, these these metallurgists that get up and they show you the microscopic cross-sectional pictures of Martin City Steel, and I go, wow, is that cool. So you can see now, if you got on your right there on the bottom, it says cold rolled mild steel. That's what the granular nature of cold rolled mild steel looks like. And we all know how strong cold rolled mild steel is. Well, let's kick it up a notch. One in the middle is 700 MPA, okay? That looks a lot different. That That looks more like granite than Moroc Dry Lake, okay, As a, if I had to give them a name. And now we go to Martin Siddick, that looks like a crystalline structure. So the long grain crystalline structure is, is also shown, Martin Siddick is up above. Basically what's happening is that the steel has a, a component part of it in it called austenite. And in its process of heat forming, it becomes Martin Siddick in the process of making it. So it's converted into its final form and strength in its process. So you go striking a weld on that whole thing, and you start buzzing a great big continuous weld down that thing, and if you've got good penetration, you fundamentally change the properties of that part forever. It's not what it was when it started out, the plant. And we really don't know what it's gonna be. So these are, the, these are why welding is so important. So the safety requirements around <laughs> doing this welding has changed. And honestly, that's kind of, I'm taking a liberty here. I needed an excuse to talk about safety. So <clears throat> if you're using a 14,500 volt, or 14,500 amp welder, I need you to understand that if you possess a pacemaker, you need to get away from that machine. So it's not gonna end well. Um, it's a safety issue. You need to know who's around you has got a pacemaker because I'm told they have an effect on them. I don't know exactly what it is. I'm not a medical professional. The other thing is I want you to offer too is you're doing your test welds and you're holding your test coupons. Those are shunting pliers. And if there's an air gap or a contamination in between those, what's electricity like to do like water? Least path of least resistance. Yeah, so you'll never get, well, they'll cut the wedding ring off at the hospital. But <laughs> I promise you, you don't, want, you don't want to do that. So don't be the shunt path. You know, we, I, I can honestly say uh, um, we had a, even an iCar instructor, sadly, experienced that. And his hand hurt for a long time after that. And he says, what I've done today is training the hard way. <laughs> Bless his heart. But, but he was showing us how don't be the shunt path. Uh, because you need to understand that when, when that welder goes on, uh, it's it's going to follow the path least resistance. Now, there's a lot of discussion about expulsion, and that's the sparks go flying out of the weld. You know, a lot of things cause expulsion. Um, if if the weld has a gap of air in there, or there's contaminations in it. Um, a lot of times, it'll spray sparks. The most important part about an expulsion weld is do you have a nugget or not? Now, that's the whole topic of conversation, some people will tell you if it's got expulsion, it's, it's a garbage weld. It's not always the case, but it needs to be tested. That weld needs to be examined. So anyway, I don't want to get into that right, right now too much, but um, power source requirements have changed. So three-phase power is required. It's the only power source that will run a modern resistance spot welder. If you have single-phase 220 in your shop, well, you're not going to power my 14500 welder. Um, single phase only provides up, I'm told, to a possibility of, of 5,000 amps, and most of these welders need at least 12,500. Many need 14,500, and the, my, the guy who's going to follow behind me, I'll let him 
clean up the mess on that, but I'm pretty sure some of our competition also feels the very same way on that. But uh, it's very important because you might have a very good welder, but if it doesn't have enough power, it's not going to give you very good welds. The other thing to keep in mind, too, is you're building up this new shop. Some guys are really investing in their businesses right now. And a modern shop compressed air system takes more power. A Kaiser, some of these most beautiful air systems I've ever seen. So they're running on a certain amount of power. Some of these UVA lights, which are doing such a wonderful job at all these different things that they do, and they, they're really wonderful. They take a lot of power. And then now we have these modern spray booths, and all these things start to add up. And if you got the guy out there welding while the booth is running, and he's over there drying the paint, do the math. <laughs> is that welder getting enough power? So these are things you have to think about when you're, when you're looking at your, at your shop. So the welders have changed, STRSW and MIG and MAG. So today's fully automated welder, why is it the newest, greatest thing? I had a shop, I was in a shop, I do a lot of in-shop training now with Spinisi, and I'm out teaching them three-dimensional measuring, and we have welder discussions, and, and the one tech, I love this question, he says, what the hell I need an auto welder for? I says, well, maybe you want the welder to think. Maybe you want to make sure the welder's working right, and then let the welder count the, and what the, let the welder set its settings. If you've got a good welder, that way now the welder's going to do it for you. But you still need to do a test panel, but that's why it's the newest, greatest thing. Because in a 14500, it's going to count up how much steel is there. It's going to check the resistance of it and understand how, how hard it is. It's going to know whether there's glue in it or not. And then it's going to set its pressure, and then it's going to set its amps and makes its weld. And when it's approved, it's because it's gone through, at least in the GM test, and this is just my experience, there's nine different um, coupon stacks, and we do three of each of those computers, 36 coupon stacks. And it's representative of all the current steels that the cars are being built with, two stack, three stack, and it's representative of how they're assembled. So you're getting the proper stack up. Can't have any cold welds, and your pull Nuggets have to be of a certain size. I'll show you that in a minute. So that's what's cool about it. And that auto welder has passed all that. So when your welder's working properly, that's the weld you're going to get. You don't have to think about it anymore. The other reason you don't want to have to think about it is we don't need the technicians to be welder experts. I want them to be collision repair experts. And if I can provide them a welder that will keep them from having to be a welder, a welder expert, in, in as much as I know how the, all the background settings and everything works on a welder. How, how many shops have a guy like that, do you think? Maybe a few? Not many, not enough. So that's why they're the coolest thing. Tip cooling to me is a big deal because if your tips get too hot, that affects the way the welder performs. Most good welders today have coolant running clear out to the tip. That's a very important factor. You want to check on that if you're in the market for a resistance spot welder. And I've gone over kind of how the welder knows what it's doing and the important of test welds. Um, what some of the other experiences I had, I went into a shop to teach, I think it was uh, electronic measuring, and we were also there to talk to them about, they were having a problem with their uh, three-gun MIG welder, our Q52. And <laughs> so this thing welded steel like it was supposed to. It just nailed it. It did silicon bronze just like it was supposed to, and that thing wouldn't MIG weld aluminum fought with it and fought with it. And I says, how long has that spool been in the welder? Oh, three years, four years probably. Okay, so you got another, yeah, I get some. Gratefully, it was in the bag. And so we got down the one that had been in the Ziploc bag, put it in. You know, oxidization is a big problem, right? You're supposed to use stainless steel brushes and clean before you make your aluminum. So we put the new spool in it, welder worked perfectly. So when that welder's sitting there all that time, and you think you can weld aluminum just at any time you want, you really ought to know how long. It, guys are date coding their, they're date coding their uh, spools of aluminum wire. So it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Um, they're also telling me, you know, I was talking to Tim Morgan about this, and, and, and he said, I think argon has a shelf life. I've had welders perform differently when I changed out tanks. Okay, is that a discussion point? I'm going to leave that as a starter. Yeah, maybe we can have some more discussion. I, I'm, I want to learn about that. I got to do more homework on that one. So alternatives to STRSW have changed. Adhesive rivet bonding is new. As you see in this picture here, that's a, uh, actually, that's a Cadillac frame rail, I, I happen to remember. Um, but anyway, that's a die cast 
aluminum strut tower going on a steel rail. So here's a plug weld in case anybody's forgot what they're supposed to look like. Uh, I just want to put that up there. That's a typical MIG plug. The thing about that MIG plug is you can't have any chemicals in there, so there's no adhesive in there. So the moment you have to have adhesive, like you see on the left, you're not doing any MIG welds anymore. You can obviously spot weld in that joint, but in this particular joint with this with the strut tower, that's a rivet bond. So that's a big deal. And I know BMW loves rivet bonding, and I think the Audi guys use it a lot too for all the various places. Certification requirements. Um, I'm gonna talk in general terms, because like I said, I'm not here to speak on behalf of General Motors. I know Jason and Joe Vianuea, who are on my team. I worked for Jason. I uh, had, had talked to, to Mark, so I'll go by what Mark has said there. But I just want to give you kind of a feel for what that coupon set looks like when we weld it up in order to get it approved by GM, whether we do it or whether GM does it in their labs. Uh, you, have, you see three different coupons here. And they leave that 10 millimeter or so tail on the bottom so they can put it in the vise. And you weld weld number one on that same exact side, you weld weld number two, and then you flip it and you weld weld number three. And then once those three are done for that particular stack up, the next stack up might be a two coupon stack. And then the next stack up is gonna be a different three stack up or and so forth and you get down through the whole thing. Every one of those, are destroyed. Every one of those nuggets, when they're pulled off, are measured. And there's a pass-fail criteria to those. So if you think these guys aren't working with the equipment, I'm telling you, you're wrong. Because at least at the, at the General Motors lab, these welders are put through their paces. And it's, it's, that's, that to me is refreshing to know. So what does the welder have to do reliably? It has to make a weld 20 times out of 20, right? It has to continue to work. And what does it need to do reliably for you as a technician? 20 out of 20. What do you need to do as a technician? Make sure your welder's in good shape. Make sure the tips are ready to go. Make sure you're using the correct tip for the vehicle you're working on. General Motors specifies a certain size and type of tip. I know some of the others always different size and type of tip. So you want to make sure you're using the right tip on your welder, and you don't want to run those tips into oblivion and wonder why your welder's not working. Change the tips, 80 to 100 welds in. Some, some go more, some go less, but work with your welder manufacturer and make sure you know what the maintenance items are on those welders. Make sure the welder has coolant in it. Make sure the welder's doing its, its proper job. And also adhesives and sealers, and please be careful with shunting. So the procedures have changed from the OEM. I went back to some of my friends at GM and what they're showing us now is where the welds are and where the adhesives are and what to use. And I just wanted to touch on that because um, gratefully the OEs are, are participating more in, in the right amount of detail so the tech has that amount that they need. So the OEM information is, is different now. All this is about is me needing to put a slide up for you to show where the dealer equipment program stuff is for General Motors. GMDE Solutions is the dealer equipment catalog. If the product is in that catalog, it's approved. And then the collision parts information and the position statements are on the genuine GM parts. That's just the GM side. Again, get with, um, get with the GM guys on that. You can also call the ICAR Technical Center on all this stuff. They do a marvelous job of supporting the technician in, in what does the OE want in, in certain situations. So. A lot has changed. Have you changed? It's going to change with or without you. What I would ask any shop that has a continuous intention of doing proper repairs is completely commit yourself to understanding the definition of proper repairs and turn around and look inside your shop and say, can I, will I do this? Do we have what we need? Do we have the people we need? Do we have the equipment we need to do proper repairs? That's all I got, thanks. Okay, okay and I'm gonna keep it rolling here. We got uh, <clears throat> Ryan Swanson with uh, ProSpot, and then I wanna get everything onto the uh, questions here. Okay, but have you guys seen the pattern that between all these different equipment suppliers and OEMs, they're all a little bit different, so we're gonna to have to be looking at different equipment to repair different cars. 
and potentially specialize in certain brands rather than we repair every car foreign and domestic? How many of you have, are seeing that kind of that pattern right now? So that said, Ryan, come on up. All right, thank you guys. All right, guys, thank you. I'll try not to take too much time for the introduction. I want to make sure that we get to all your guys' questions and make sure that you guys get everything out of this that you want to. And I also apologize uh, being here at SEMA for a couple days, a little bit hoarse, so apologize about that. Um, but these guys have hit a lot of this stuff, you know, dead on the head today with what we're talking about and the challenges that we're facing in today's industry. So um, I'm going to get right into it. And this is something that we came up with at ProSpot and that we've been using. And it really settles, you know, at home for me coming from the collision repair side as a former technician. So no training, no success, no training, no success. So if you're not constantly training and understanding the way things are being done and the way things are changing in the industry, you're not going to have success. You're just not going to have success. Your technicians can't be successful if they are not constantly training and understand the changes that are happening in the industry as these guys have been talking about. No longer is a car just steel. So once again, you know, coming up last, these guys have really hit on all this stuff. So I want to get through it for your guys' questions. But as you can see from this slide right here, no longer is a car just mild steel. We have, you know, mid-grade steels, high-strength steels, ultra-high-strength steels, advanced high-strength steels. We have boron steels. And we now have aluminum being mixed into that. So you have like Cadillacs that are being made with cast aluminum wheelhouses that are rivet bonded in, while the apron and everything else is different grades of steel that are spot welded or or well bonded in. So it's something that you definitely got to take a look at and not just take for granted that, well, I've always been doing it this way so I can keep doing it this way. It's just not the case anymore. Just another quick slide right there. Once again, optimizing structure for lightweight. So we're tasked today with making these cars fuel efficient, right? So how do we do that? Fuel efficient and safe. Well, we got to make them lighter but we have all this fancy stuff that everybody wants to put in there. We got seat warmers and we have all this, you know, blind spot monitors, reverse sensors and cameras. So those add weight and things to the vehicle that change. So we have to adapt to that and how do we make the car safe? Well, we can have these different steels, these different makeups and different structures. But the main thing here is nobody follows the same platform. GM or Toyota or Honda, they don't all just have the same material mix. They all change, they all have a different way of looking at things and they all have different criteria as these guys have been talking about up here on stage today. And then uh, here's a great picture. Uh, Bob had a couple slides up there of the GM testing. So I actually uh, put a couple slides in here to show you guys. This is an actual tear test from the GM testing that he was just showing you. Uh, and this goes along with just because it's a spot welder, an auto spot welder, or smart spot welder does not mean destructive tests are not needed. If you're not performing destructive tests every single job on every single different stack up, you're doing yourself, your shop, and your customer a disservice. How do you know that the welder's performing correctly if you don't practice first to make sure that the welder's doing what it's supposed to do? If you have the air conditioning running and all these different things are running inside of your shop, is that affecting your building power, your three-phase power? Is your welder working the way that it should? So those are all things that you guys have to keep in mind and make sure that you're asking yourself that question every single day. And not only that, but are your techs out there following in that path? Do they care about this? Are they watching this? Are they test welding? Or are they going to the customer's car and doing a couple welds and then going over to the welder to dial it in? If that's what you're doing, you're doing something wrong and we need to make sure that we're not doing that. Does your shop have welding SOPs in place? Are they followed every time, every job? So this is something coming from a former shop manager. You know, I printed out the repair procedures, give it to the technician and you think, good, they're following repair procedures, right? Well, no, do they understand the 30 pages that they're reading? Do they know how to look at the different things that they're telling them how to do with MIG brazing, spot welding, auto mode, or hey, you have to set up 350 decanewtons 1.2 seconds uh, for 8.5 KA. How many of your technicians know how to walk up to the welder and type that in to make sure that that weld's done correctly on, let's say, that Honda or that Subaru? Got to ask yourself that question, and maybe it's time to go out to your shop and ask your techs that question if they know how to do that or they know what they're reading on those repair procedures when that stuff comes up. Do you dress or change your tips every so many welds? 
This may change between different caps that you're using or different cars or different welders that you're using, whether it's a Pro Spot or a Spinisi or you know, Chief or Carliner, it doesn't matter. We might all have different ways of looking at this, but it might also depend on the caps that you're using. So do you have an SOP in place to make sure that your technicians are following that so that you're fixing these cars correctly and getting those correct welds and not getting those welds that Mark was talking about from his the, uh, nightmare this morning? Uh, do you have a maintenance schedule set up? Someone in your shop doing it? Is your local distributor doing it? Do you have a technician assigned who knows what he's doing and make sure that the welder has coolant, make sure the caps are changed and make sure that everything is performing as it should? If you don't, maybe it's time to look in the mirror and make sure that you put these things in place so that you cover yourself and make sure that you're making these people are safe once you fix their cars. And then finally, uh, before we get to the panel here, is do not overlook the basics, as we've been talking about today. Back to the basics. What does your shop welder look like, right? We've all seen this before, traveling around just like these guys do behind me. We've all seen the welder in the shop that looks like the one on the right, looks like a dinosaur chewed on the arms, and you know, I, I don't think anyone's ever wiped it off with a rag, or does your welder look like the one on the left who I can tell you I know that shop owner very well, and that welder is three and a half years old, and it looks dang near brand new. So what welder do you have in the shop? The one that the dinosaur is chewed on, or the one that stays in the corner and gets taken care of, gets maintained, tips changed, maybe new arms every once in a while once they start arcing out? And that's it for me, guys. Uh, sorry, I went a little fast, but I want to make sure that we got to the questions and you guys got everything out of it. The guys behind me did a great job starting it out. So let's get to the panel. Okay, thank you. Okay, so s many of you uh, may have some questions, and we're gonna and we're not gonna do like an open mic, but we do have cards on, and, and all you gotta do is fill out the card, hold it up. Aaron will come around if you got questions, and we and he'll field the questions coming in. So what we're going to do, we're going to just sit around and have a, and have a uh, conversation. Oh, you got some questions already. Here we go. We'll just take these up with us. Okay, so. Okay, so Sean, they want to know, is the future trending to move to more mechanical cold joining methodology? So rather than welding, cold joining methodology. Uh, that's a good question. I, th Based on the experience that I have and the training that we've gone to, um, there's going to be a good mix of both hot and cold joining technologies. Um, the car bodies that we're seeing come out, the newest versions, um, we've got the Q7, which is hybrid construction, what we consider hybrid construction, which means that it is mixed with aluminum, steel, and we know we can't attach aluminum to steel with welding. Uh, so there's going to be cold joining techniques with adhesive rivets. There's also going to be steel components that have to be joined to other steel components. So we're going to see, see welding with either MIG welding or squeeze type resistant spot welding. So it's, it's definitely going that way where we're going to have a mix of those different types of joining techniques. Okay, perfect. And we'll just kind of come down the line. Mr. Marks. Um, so Tony Kraft, thanks for being here. Um, so can you attend the JAG weld certification class without being in the JAG network sh uh, shops? Yeah, fair enough, good question. Um, actually right now, unfortunately, that is not, uh, it's not possible. Um, due to the fact we're contracted with Jaguar Land Rover, uh, we have had some folks attend uh, after uh, asking, you know, going through certain channels, we've had some industry people allowed, but um, it is not, you know, so unfortunately, no. Okay, awesome. So I'm just gonna kind of run down. We, uh, so what we did is we did a call. We had everybody on the call and we've been passing out the questions. There should be no trick questions here, except unless Dave wants to throw one in, which, you know, that could happen, right, Dave? I think it's some reason why we opened it. Well, no, that's, that's, a tr that's, that's the light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> that's what that and it's looks bright. like. <laughs> Yeah, you Dave, go towards, towards the light. Okay. light go there, towards you know? the light. Go towards the light, Dave. Yeah. Some <laughs> okay. of us will see the light and some will not. <laughs> okay, so I'm, so I'm going to ask the question, and just uh, I'm going to kind of throw it to anybody here that wants to handle it. I think we all know the question, but it's really, um, and, I, and I think, Ryan, you, you said it best, but I'm just going to ask the question. Should we be practicing our welds on a customer's vehicle? 
Uh, yeah, I'll take that one to start. Um, that that's one of the scariest things to me that you know that I hear, but but I hear it all the time, or you see it all the time out there. Um, absolutely not. If you're testing on a customer's car and trying to dial in the welder while you have their rear body panel up or their quarter panel clamped in, uh, you're doing something wrong. By the time you get to the customer's car, you should be comfortable. You should know that your hand position and where you want to be and where those overhead welds are going to be, where those vertical welds are going to be, and know what your setting is going to be before you ever walk up to the car and even strike an arc or squeeze the trigger um, on a customer's car. So. So, so is it safe to say that if you're not doing test welds for the combinations that you're actually doing, you're probably not welding the car correctly? Absolutely, and that's a great point. You know, cars today are no longer just two layers or three layers. Sometimes they can be four or more, um, and those different kinds of steels change as we've been talking about. So if you're not test uh, doing destructive tests on each one of those stack ups to make sure that you're comfortable with the setting, whether it's MIG welding or spot welding or, or brazing or whatever the procedures are telling you to do, then yeah, you're doing something wrong or you're leaving a variable there that you're not accounting for. Okay, so perfect. So I'm gonna make a statement and you've probably heard this and many of you probably have this technician in your shop that's been doing this 30 years. We don't need to read no stinking instructions. So let me tell you uh, one thing as a shop owner that you can do to just check on this. Uh, take your stack of, of, uh, of material that you're gonna give to them saying here, read all this information, this is how you fix the car and put a $100 bill about 15 pages in. Do you think I'm kidding? And when it's all done, they'll hand them back to you, see if that $100 bill's still there. You'll find that oftentimes it's still there. And then as soon as somebody finds one $100 bill the first time, they'll read them from then on, at least they'll look for the $100 bill. But, but the reality is you'll be shocked that you might get it to the car, but you won't get it there. So, so I'm just gonna throw this out to anybody who wants to, wants to handle it. That, so the car's built a certain way. We got 45 welds, they're all squeeze type from the factory. What about we just throw 30 welds back in, put it back the same way it was built? Are we going to be okay? Uh, I, I think you got to be ready to be on this one of the stages earlier because not only will you be buying your car, you'll be giving your business away to some attorney. Yep. Um, the, the car will fail. Yep. And, and earlier when I was just talking about the three stack ups, when we talk about doing a test weld, and the car has three stack ups of a thick metal that's very hard, another thick metal that's pretty hard, and a thin metal that's soft. If you don't have the right welder and the right program, it will fail instantly before your eyes. And a, a lot of the technicians will just keep on going and figure out a way to put the metals together, but it just failed before they started. Uh, that car is impossible to get fixed right because you don't have the right you know, you're trying to shave your face with a dull knife. You don't have the right razor. I mean, you have to have the right equipment first. You want to take that? One of the other things I've noticed too on weld count, you know, in my experience at General Motors, as I was assigned to a vehicle program in its development, it was, Bob, we need you to, like these other SEs, figure out what that part's going to look like in its service part form. So when we sell that rear frame rail or we sell that rear floor pan or we sell that body side or that center pillar uh, and all that. So one of the meetings we would sit through is what's called a CIE analysis uh, meeting. And CIE analysis is basically what they've done, bring a math model of the entire body structure and the body in white up on the tube and, uh, and they'll, they'll bring it up on the screen and they'll do this in, in, in at Saturn when I was there, they would do it at a big screen and they bring everybody in. And what they're doing in CAE is they're crashing the car over and over and over and over, same barrier. And you're watching this math model fold up just like it would if it were in that accident. And I've sat there and watched these engineers go down through, all right, move all that stuff out of the way, and then you're watching just the rail. Well, that simulation accounts for the entire car while it's going. You just have certain parts turned off and you're watching just the rail now. He says, "That's I need to move that up here. And they would say, what do we gotta do? Well, we gotta make it out of this. Well, ch ch change it, and now it's into the new material. Okay, it didn't move it just right. Give me four more welds. There it is, that's fixed. Now, here's the thing. You don't put those four welds in, figure it out for yourself. There's a reason <clears throat> there's that many welds in that place. So, so let me ask the question then, and, and I'll just roll it right back to you. So if we have a 30 year technician, I've been doing this 30 years, and they want to use the same technology they've been working on for 30 years. What's the latest model year car they should 
apply their 30-year technology to. Thinking maybe <laughs> we might get risky and go all the into the early 80s. Yeah. Yeah, so if, so basically a Chevy Citation, if you're going to use 30-year technology. Oh, Sean, we got something going on there? Yeah. Chevy Citation, I'm just curious, right? <laughs> okay, so now I, I don't know the answer to this question, but it came, came from the audience here, and I'm not even sure if I'm going to say it right, but it says, do you know, and maybe it's going to go right to you, Bob, but do you know if GM has addressed the non-repair of the pickup inner broke uh, rocker in the procedure or position statements? Do, do you know? And if not, we can find out. I can get back to you. I don't know, but maybe you do. I'd really like Mark for you to reach out to GM on that. I can do that, that exact position. And, and again, you know, I've been a, I'm a, I've been away enough months to where there could be some changes and enhancements that have been made to that procedure that that I wouldn't be aware of. But I can tell you this: the guy that wrote that procedure has been at this a really long time, and he doesn't miss much. Not on the first time, never mind the second time. There usually isn't a second time. So his procedure took into account the strength of that part. It, it'll show you uh, everything you need to know about making repairs in that area. I'll be very surprised if it isn't. In, it doesn't provide every bit of information. But wait a minute. So being a smart ass. Um, mm -hmm. So if that happens and we have to replace that, it might total. I don't know. It's going to depend My on the My point is it's a total, right? Everybody yeah. agree with that? No, it's not necessarily a total. Well, we're, if we're you can't repair it, stuff. if you can't repair it. Oh, and you can repair it. No, what I'm saying is the non-repairable. So the non-repair, if somebody says the part's not repairable and repair, and if you have to replace it and that totals the car, what's the answer? Well, if it totals the car, Car's it totals the, total. the car. Yeah. Yep. You know, this is, this is about returning something back to the road that is not going to be a danger to society. Okay. And if that drives vehicle replacement, then maybe that drives vehicle replacement. I don't know. Okay. So I'm going to point one at you, Sean. Well, cause you're like, you, we haven't been paying much, very much attention to you. Yeah. So, so welding expectations. So they build a car the same at a certain way at the factory. And then in the aftermarket, we do welds. Is it the same? No, it's okay. not the same. Um, obviously, at the factory, they have a much bigger power level. Uh, they have different equipment. Um, if you've seen videos of vehicles being manufactured, the weld heads are enormous. Um, and what we have duplicates it fairly well, uh, but it's not 100%. And that's why a lot of times you see in procedures where they won't say, do exactly what the manufacturer put in. You know, if you take 20 welds out, you put 20 welds back in. Is a lot of times it will say, you took 20 welds out, you're gonna put 30 welds now, or, or add a certain number, or multiply, or you know, however the equation works for each of those different procedures, depending on what it is. So, that, so that's why we see that you know, you're, the <clears throat> excuse me, putting it back the same way it came out probably is not there. So I'm gonna ask one more question. And I think, Dave, you'll probably pick this one up and run with it like a football. Um, so how do we establish predictability? Like predictability in our welds and our processes. How, how do we just establish that in, in our industry? Well, one thing that is, is great in my particular case, the, um, the spot welder we sell actually tracks the weld. And it actually certifies the weld. And it, you can put the weld on the estimate. What's going to really happen now is the technology in all these machines, it pretty much always comes up together. It's never like just one company or the other. And it'll, it'll give you the proper weld. It'll, if you have all the proper um, program coming for the manufacturer, you could kind of, you could predict every detail of how it should uh, hold up. Um, tied to this though, is one of the problems is the technician a lot of times it takes the easy way out on the piece of equipment. So he's immediately reaching for the welder that's older, that has a smaller welder gun on it, that doesn't put out enough pressure on the tips, doesn't put out enough amperage for these welds. But, but it's lighter and easier though. Yeah, I know, it's much easier. It's, 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 obviously it has to be better. I'm still looking at these lights. Yes, I did steal it. I couldn't help it, I, I'm guilty. Anyway, I'm just saying, it was just, it, it, it's, difficult to to actually unless you have all of these other um steps going on in your business and you're doing everything everyone's been talked about here on the way you're running your business the way you're running your double check and triple checks your systems how can you predict do any of this 
So, 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 yeah, so let me let, let me hit that on the predictability level, and I'm going to jump to people that sell the equipment, right? So, <clears throat> Bob and Ryan. So, if I say I'm going to put a Unisite on a Toyota or a Honda or whatever, and it requires uh, resistance, you know, it's a squeeze type resistance spot weld operation. We're not worried about where we're sectioning it with the mag welder, but how often should we change our tips or dress our tips? And we get, can we get 500 welds? Can we get two? Um, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna kind of jump back to the same kind of question back to on the OEM level, because when I talked to General Motors, they were saying that they actually have a schedule of dressing on the tips at the factory level and then a change out at the factory level. So, so Ryan, I'm gonna to talk to you, ask you that, but you just shook your head saying you know about this from the OEM level. So why don't you guys kind of just play with that one a little bit because oftentimes I'll talk to suppliers, and many of you probably do. So somebody buys a uh, welder and they buy and they haven't bought any tips for six or eight months. Are, are we probably okay on our welds or what's going on there? <laughs> if you have not bought tips in six or eight months, you're doing something wrong. Um, and that's a great point. It, it can be the cap selection, whether, you know, it's, it's a flatter style cap or whether it's an A style cap that might dictate how often you have to change those caps. Um, but for the most part, you know, really the rule of thumb is 150 to 200 welds at the most before you change those caps over. The more often, the better, guys. They are not expensive to replace these welding caps. And the cleaner that they are and the more that they hold the shape that they're supposed to, the better off we are. As these guys have been talking about, these cars taking an incredibly amount of squeeze pressure these days to create the proper weld for these boron steels. It's not like it used to be where, you know, 500 pounds of tip pressure was good and your caps didn't get smushed at all. Nowadays, these welders are putting over a thousand pounds easy for tip pressure and your caps are not going to hold up the same way. And that also depends on the style of cap. So yeah, if you're not buying caps and you're not dressing your tips often and you don't have an SOP in place. And once again, I go back to, I just like a dinosaur chewed on it. There's a problem. I showed up to a shop a couple weeks ago and, and it happened to be a shop that I used to work at. And so I decided to stop by on my way home and say hi to the guys. And uh, they had a pro spot, uh, I, I four in there. And when I got there, they said, Ryan, it's uh, blowing sparks on me every single time. I, I try to make a weld on anything. It doesn't matter what I weld, it's blowing sparks. So let's go take a look at it. And I walk back there and I, I kid you not, it, I mean, it's not funny, but it's, it's a true story. They didn't even have a weld cap on the gun side. The cap was off and they had ground down the tip of the electrode. <laughs> they didn't have any caps, right? So the tech was trying to figure out how to get a job done one day. Well, guess what? When they took the cap off, the gun had enough travel in order to, they must have made a few welds maybe before it started sparking on them. And then after it started sparking on them, now the tips aren't even touching because you don't have a cap on there. And now the electrodes smush down. I mean, it's, I, and it, it's reality, guys. This is what you You can't make shop. that up, can you? No, it's yeah. scary. Yeah. Okay. Bump. Yeah, it's been in my my experience too. We've seen some of that. Now, one of the one of the things about at least the fourteen five hundred is that if you take the cap off, it's it's leaking coolant um, immediately. So we at least have that in our favor. It's you know I don't know if that was the case on an I four. I don't no, think an so I four needed that technology when it was developed. That's a workhorse of a welder. But yeah, the I four was not water cooled to the tip, so they yeah. didn't get that. Yeah, they didn't that get one. that. So I just want to let's want to be clear on that because most on on any of today's like I fives, I fives or I four S's, I think all they cool to the tip because we we noticed that but um so you know i i had gone into a shop also a little while back there having problems with the uh with the piston on the on the welding machine and of course it ended up needing a new uh cylinder um but not only hadn't the tips been changed i don't think they ever had any replacement tips and that was one of our very first 14,500 welders from way back that thing had been in that shop for a really long time and that the arm they are using had a lot of miles on it and it was loose so and that affects tip alignment which affects your ability to make a weld properly and the thing was a mess and on and on and on so we gave it the update and uh, gave the guy that owns the shop a list of parts that he's going to need to buy and hopefully that welder's back online now but you know, these are the things that we find every single day. I don't, I don't have sadly very high expectations. I wish I could about what I'm going to walk into in any given shop. So um, I do, however, walk into some shops that really keep good tight reins on their stuff, and and they're very serious about their investment. So that's encouraging. So, uh, so if, if 
in my experience, I'm everybody on the stage here would agree, I, I'm sure, but if you want to check one thing in your shop when you get back there on Monday, go back and look at your spot welder and look at your tips and see, and see how many tips you're buying. You probably are going to discover immediately what these guys have been talking about. Unless... Unless you're just collecting equipment to look at it. Yeah. That's like you're not well, using your spot welder. <laughs> yeah, but then, then it doesn't matter. Then don't put a plug on it because that'll just. Yeah, just make out. sure yeah. no one can use it. Yeah. Yeah. And so can you say one more thing? I want to have you just address real quickly. Um, first of all, Bob, at the OEM level, how often are they changing tips out at, on the assembly line? I don't know the exact frequency, but I do know that that is a very well developed um, dictate, let's call it from the welding team there's a there's a group of metallurgists and welding specialists that work at general motors that um spend a, their entire career directing how the vehicles will be welded together and there's no short laundry list about what weld guns need to go through and and what kind of a maintenance protocol the other thing i want you to know too is we talk about test welds here at the repair level there's what we call weld destruct booths in every automotive plant that General Motors makes cars in, and they're giant. They look like spray booths, and you're wondering, what, we're in body fab. What's a spray booth doing in body fab? Well, it's full of people with guns, and they're busting these cars all apart. They're doing a well-destruct test. Yeah, that's a good point. That's what I was going to say is, you know, even on the factory level with these robots that are putting cars together, they will have, depending upon the manufacturer, they'll pull random cars off the line and go ahead and pull these cars apart and chisel the welds apart to make sure that the robots and everything are doing what they're supposed to. A lot rather find that out at the plant because when you have to do that recall, that's a fun repair in the field. Anyway. Dave is chomping at the bit. He's got no, no. Of course, it's, it's the technology again has evolved very far on the welders. Um, that our welder has you zero out the tip when you clean it or replace it, and then it starts counting down while you're welding. And after a hundred welds, it makes you reclean your tips, makes you zero out the gun. Also, during your weld process. If you do a weld that's no good, the welder will actually tell you your weld is no good. So, uh, and there's other welders here, I'm sure, have the same technology in them, but they're, this is, it's gone very far because, again, they're putting out a crazy amount of amperage, a crazy amount of power, and the liability is scary. Um, to Sean's thing, when Audi does a test to certify a spot welder, I mean, they test the heck out of it, and we don't get an opportunity to test it. They test it. You bring it in, they're shown this is how it works, and then you leave. It's, they are the ones who beat the heck out of it and figure it out. So, Okay, so I'm going to hit this question here, and, I'm, and it, it's kind of drawn down, I'm, I don't, and I, it, so bear with me. Okay, so it says, discuss or cover the number of replacement welds versus the stagger space between welds in various areas of the OE position statements and procedures in scalloped and going over old spot welds and squeeze type inline or skip sequence. Okay, so I'm gonna put this in English. Um, so going over the top of old spot weld replacements next to them, you know, we got like Volvo that says in, on non-structural, like a quarter to go over the old one. We got Volvo that says if it's a uh, structural, like a frame rail, you're gonna go next to it. You know, we got Audi, obviously, they got a position and Jag and, you know, and, and that. So let, so I'm assuming that's where that question's going. Like, there's there's different things that we got to do in different circumstances. So who wants to take that one? Uh, from, from, from what I've always seen and heard and uh, been told, in most cases, you do not go over the old weld because you don't want to um, overheat and destroy the characteristics of the metal. So you're going in between. Um, Sean can. As, as a general rule, of course, yeah. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, well for our, from the Audi standpoint, our rule is typically if there is adhesive, if it's multi-layered, so it's not just two layers, if it's three layers, and there's adhesive between the inner two layers that you're attaching a new part to, then you will go on top of that same spot. Because it doesn't. It, for us, it doesn't make sense to go through the adhesive because the adhesive is an insulator. So that current is not going to go through that. You're dealing with cu cured adhesive. That yes, pains cure, cured adhesive, yeah. Yeah, difference between cured adhesive and obviously putting on a new panel that has uncured adhesive, for sure. That's a big difference. So so, it, it, so every car is going to be different. We can't just put a blanket statement on top of this. That's I think right. That's where you we know, are. The, the general guideline or the industry standard, we don't have one. No, and, and that's a that's – a, I'm really glad you brought that up because um, for the longest time – I say for the longest time. I don't know, for a period of years, and it maybe is still current, um, there's this thing in, in formed and pierce and trim – in die design that 
uh, is a mass savings advantage. He covered this wonderfully how we might need to make cars lighter, but they still need to be stronger. So the dictate comes out to the body structures group on a certain platform. Hey, let's do a bunch of scallop parts on this because when you when you scallop back that part, you're taking weight out of it, albeit a little bit. We do it a lot all throughout the vehicle. That pile of little extra coins that you've scalloped out adds up. So that's why they do the scalloping. And the problem with that is that when you're making a repair there, you don't have that metal next door to go to. So now what do we do? Well, I've seen, uh, this is where it's crucial to go back to the OE because those guys that have got a weld that's already gonna be maybe either, they're gonna entertain welding over it, they're gonna have to get a buy off on that. Then the next thing is, is you get away from welding entirely and you go to a flow form rivet gun which goes back to that same address where there may have even been an SPR or if there had been a spot weld, it overbores it and puts a rivet right in there, right at the same location. Maybe even sometimes where there was an SPR before because an SPR is a smaller diameter. But now we're into the art and science of riveting. But that has got to be driven by the OE and it usually is. Okay, so what we're seeing in the panel here is we're seeing that there's there's a lot of, a lot of stuff to welding. So now I wanted to jump into, there's a lot of uh, companies out there that are like, okay, we need welding training. And most of your equipment suppliers will provide training. So, and, and so I know that the, the three of you provide training. And I don't want you to talk for 45 minutes and make it a commercial for your company, but talk about real quickly the, the training that's available, that you know, your success rate, what does it look like? Are they certified on anything when they're done? And just give us the, you know, the, the two-minute elevator speech, and I want to hear from all three of you on that. Yeah, definitely. So uh, when you buy a piece of equipment from ProSpot, it comes from the distributor uh, with an install and training. And what we really push for that and what really I'm, I'm tasked with is training our distributors to make sure that they understand the collision repair industry as it is today. Because as we've been talking about, it's not the same as it was 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and unfortunately, it's hard to get everybody out there that, you know, is a salesman and a welding expert, right? That's just not the reality that's out there. So, uh, you know, we're constantly working on it and trying to improve the process, but we want to make sure that you don't necessarily have a salesman that's out there training you. We want to make sure that the guys that are out there dropping off the equipment and spending the time with your technicians understand what they're telling your technicians and are telling them the right thing and going about it the right way. So when we go out there and do that, uh, we have a strict way that we have our distributors uh, go onto a form and they fill out date, time at the shop, the technician's name, the manager's name, the piece of equipment that they trained on, and the time that they were there at the shop because technician turnover is huge in today's world. So, you know, I'm sure it's not uh, just us, but I'm sure you get the ones where, you know, the welder was trained six months ago and, and everybody was there and now five months later they have no idea what they're doing. Um, and then you go back and look at the names and neither one of the five technicians that were trained on the welder are still at the shop. So that's why you know companies are trying to advance the way that they do things like ProSpot with the I4S. We have training on the welder. So if you have the I4S spot welder, you can go on and learn how to change arms, create work orders, tie that work order to a technician, email that work order to the manager, production manager, whoever is keeping track of the file to document what you're doing. These are all ways that we're trying to advance it to make it easier for the technician to get that training so that he uses the welder the right way. If they don't know how to use the welder, how can you expect them to do things the right way? They got to know how to do it. Okay, Bob. Yeah, for us, when we uh, when we move a welder right now, we have a training arm which is different than the sales arm. Like like Ryan said, we 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 rely on our, our sales guys to know a lot about our welders in order to answer the questions that'll come. But we also offer a training, and we'll do it on site. And there's a couple three of us that'll go anywhere in the nation to to spend time with the shop and help them understand how to get this welder set up. Uh, help them understand if their power requirements are exactly what they need and also work with them on how to operate the welder and operate it properly. Not only at first, but of course going forward, which talks about let's make sure the tips are on a, on a, on a scheduled maintenance. Let's make sure you keep an eye on, on these check marks, uh, items that you need to do in maintenance. And then here's what you need to expect out of the performance of the welder. And if it falls off from that, or if you hear these certain things change, we need you to, here's how you keep track of what your welds are, the, the machine does that. And, and how to work the welder. So we're doing a lot of the same sort of thing in our own way that, that the ProSpot folks are doing, and I'm sure that's the same case for you, Dave. Okay, yeah. so I'm going to say one thing, Dave, I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you to tie it into your, your response here. So, so I just bought a welder from you, but I want a discount. I want it to be as cheap as I possibly can, and my guy, he doesn't need training. 
you guys have never heard this before, I'm sure. So, never. so we don't need the training. Just yeah, give right. me the welder. It's a smart welder. Are we okay with this? Uh, it was a little bit of pride. Uh, we don't do business like that anymore. <laughs> um, because, you know, we're... 99% of the people we deal with are going to become certified by one of the big programs. And our requirement in our contract with the um, welding companies as well as the car companies is we train the people so they could go pass the welding test. So when you purchase a welder, it um, comes with a trainer. Everything's very documented, very kept track of. He happened to pick Hillary at the beginning of this program to talk to. If there is one girl that is so analytically and metrics minded is Hillary. So not to screw up a world on her car. No, or if you ask her a question, you better be ready to, you better be right. And you better be ready for a 30 minute answer. But anyway, now we, um, our trainers are trainers. They, um, we have a pretty large staff of trainers. We, most people are also under some kind of a training agreement to get retrained, whether it's six months or 12 months later, and it's in their service contract. So, but yeah, we don't do things the, what you just said. Yeah, it, don't just drop it off. Okay. So, Mark, so one, just one yeah, go ahead. quick, you know, these guys have a difficult job because their trainers that are going out can only train on how that piece of equipment operates. They can't go out and say, well, you know, you can fix this car this way with this machine because they might not have that knowledge yet. And I ask that, and when we do our training, I mean, I put up the requirements that we do for what the prep is of our panels. And in our training, I always ask the guys, like, how many of you guys have had the spot welder equipment guy say, oh, you don't need to clean the e-code off. That's, that's good corrosion protection. Just leave it on there. The welder will weld right through it. And they go, oh, yeah, yeah, we, we do that all the time. And I'm like, but e-code wasn't designed to be welded through. So why would you do that? And and that's a difficulty because, you know, these guys are going to show them how to use the equipment. But then it's up to the technician to figure out, okay, I know how to use it, but how am I going to use it correctly on the actual vehicle that I'm working on? Excellent point. Excellent point. Okay. So it's uh, so we're going to roll in to wrap this up. I want to give everybody on the stage one minute. And I want to keep it to one minute that anything that you were burning to say, you wanted this. And, and, and the intention of this panel was, is that everybody that's here, again, all of you are on the panel. Remember, you raised your hands. That was a while ago, but you're, you're on the court here. And w we had a real intention that you walk out of here with, oh, my gosh, we got to look at some things in our shop. We got to talk to the people we know. We got to really get to the next level. And also in your sphere of influence, right? That was the intention we had for this panel. So that said, anything that, that anybody wanted to, that we didn't get done, we didn't get said, I want to give you guys an opportunity to do this and then also make it available for anybody that if you want to ask anybody on this panel a question after this is over, it, it, anybody here risk adverse to talking to anybody about welds? No. Okay, good. So Ryan, go ahead. You got a minute. Yeah, so we, we've talked a lot, a lot today about a lot of different things and, and some of you guys out there might be sitting there going, you know, holy cow, I need to go back to my shop and do something. And so that's the biggest thing that we want you guys to get out of this is to open your minds up and make sure that you don't have that attitude of my technician has been doing this for 20, 30 years. He's super good. I don't have to worry about his work. No work ever comes back. Make sure that you guys are out there. You have SOP. SOPs in place, your guys are following them, they're not getting forgotten, and make sure that you're talking to your technicians and your staff inside of the shop and making sure that they're talking to the technicians. Your estimators are helping out the guys understand what the repair procedures are saying, and they're not just handing them a stack of 30 pages and saying, oh, he knows what to do, because that's not the reality. Repair procedures can be long, and sometimes they can be hard to understand, so sometimes it might take one or two people to, hey, does this read... Does it, do you understand it the same way I do? Does that say MIG braze or does that say I need to spot weld it? So, you know, don't take advantage or for granted that your guys know what they're doing. That's just not the case. There's too much liability in today's collision world. There's too many different ways of doing things. You know, Honda does things different from GM and GM does things different from Subaru or Audi. So no one is the same. No vehicle platform is the same. And no one looks at these things that we're talking about today the same way or writes them the same way in their repair procedures. So open your minds, have these conversations conversations with your techs, go out, check your welders, call your local distributor, find out who is supposed to be out there and make sure that you have what you need. Tips, wire is being put away. You don't leave the wire in the welder for four years. 
that's real on aluminum. That's not good to do. Um, that causes friction and you're going to get bad welds and you're going to get dirty welds that won't be, won't be good. So ask yourself that question and make sure that you have processes in place to cover yourself, the shop, and make sure that you would be happy putting your mom back in the car that you're fixing. Okay, and can you see that everybody up here is passionate? Because when I say one minute and he rolls on for three, great information. But, you know, passion is like amazing. So, Bob, jump in. Yeah, one minute. Yeah. Uh, so here we go. <laughs> Things have changed. Have you? That was the end of my, pres my presentation. But what is it that we're talking about? If you're going to own the equipment, know about it. Because there's a price for not knowing it now. It used to be there wasn't a price, it seemed. But now there's a price to be paid. And the price to be paid is that the vehicle isn't going to perform properly if there's a next time. And you're tossing the dice, you're flipping the coin here, and you just don't want to run a business with that kind of risk cooked into it. Because every day that technicians are making improper repairs, you're just increasing the statistical, um, ob the statistical occurrence that you're going to be faced with the outcome of that. In, in the form of litigation. So uh, if you need motivation in your business, do this under a protective mode for yourself. Just get this stuff right. And we can help you, ICAR can help you. There's a lot of sources for this information and the OE needs to be the one you go to first for the most current procedures. All those subscriptions are available even for short term. If you don't do very much GM and you got two cars in, get the short, short one and go. No, go ahead. Okay, so what could you do and what could you say in one minute Everybody in this room needs to be a member of SCRS. That's how you got this information. That's Amen. how you'll find this information. You have the DEG group to answer and help you with details on these procedures. You have people that are an instant resource to you to get all of this information. Videos are going to be followed up from this group. You could go to my company has great videos on training. We Lander and Chill, our partner, has great videos on training. But none of this will be available to you unless you take advantage of the Society of Collision Repair Specialists. It's the biggest, biggest asset we have. We need this. And please, if you are not a member, join it. Because we need you as much as you need us. Absolutely. Thank you, Dave. Yeah. Thank you, Dave. That was beautiful. Okay, Steve. Yeah, thank you. Um, if somebody asked me for... One minute. Yeah, I got you. Uh, somebody asked before about, you know, is JLR training available to the, the general industry? No, they're not. Um, however, um, ICAR has a lot of good welding training. Basically, we have a, a steel welding certification that we now have a make braze um, hands-on skill development program. We have rivet bonding programs. We have a lot of training available, and I think the main thing it is, as everybody said, uh, the maintenance of your equipment is really, really important. Make sure that all of the preparation is done correctly. Make sure your techs get trained. And make sure you have the proper equipment. And also make sure you're following OE requirements because they vary. And a lot of people don't realize that they're different. One weld is not the same on every car. Perfect. Sean? All right. Well, the one word is training. Um, <laughs> you got to have training to know how to use the equipment. you got to have training to know how to read the repair procedures. Uh, you're not alone out there. Don't think if you have a question like, well, I'll just do this and, and that'll be good enough. Um, ask the questions. Find out who you need to get in touch with, whether it's OEM, whether it's the product, uh, the equipment manufacturer, and uh, get that question answered before you go ahead and uh, damage a vehicle that may have been repairable. Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to bring this home real quickly with saying, so at the OEM level, so the, the name of this panel was Meeting the OEM Expectation in Welding. So the manufacturers hold themselves to a standard as well. And we've kind of been hearing that, but one of them is Subaru. So how many of you heard that there was a welding concern, not like a massive safety recall, nobody died, but a welding concern on Subaru on one of their models where they actually did a recall to say, you know what, that's not good enough for our promise to our consumer. We're gonna bring those back and take care of them. How many of you guys heard that, right? The manufacturers OEMs are taking, <coughs> are coming to the level <clears throat> from the safety and that standpoint of fastening it together. And we're not going to have an opportunity to go back and double check ours. So at the OEM level, it's everything, Sean, right? Yep. It's everything. Nissan, years ago, they, their robot took a two-week break and didn't put some glue in the rocker pan. It happened, right? They didn't put the glue in the lower rocker panel, and they had to go back and re-weld those, and that was a recall. OEMs are serious about the attachments, how their cars are engineered. 
we got to put it back exactly the same way that they said. And that's what this panel was all about. So that said, thank you, Society of Collision Repair Specialists. Thank you, everybody on the panel. And thank you for being here, because you guys were the panel as well. Thank you.